Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on the state of Java in the enterprise in 2023. Today, um, I'm going to be working or speaking with Mark Englund, a product strategist from Baden, and we're going to be talking about results from a survey that we recently did asking organizations about how they're using Java and how they see Java in the year to come in their particular companies. So we're going to dive into a lots of numbers today. Uh, but before we get started with that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. As you've probably noticed, your lines are muted during the webinar, but you can ask questions. There is a questions icon should be in the lower right part of your screen. Um, and if you click on that, you can put questions in. Uh, we'll probably save most of the questions until the end of the presentation, but we do have time allocated for that. So please feel free to add those as we go through. Um, we will also be emailing you a link to the slides and the recording within 24 hours after the webinar. So usually one of the most common questions we get is, can I get the slides? And the answer is yes. Um, so look for those in your email box. For those of you who may not be familiar with Baden or less familiar with Baden, just a quick five seconds on that. Vaden is really focused on helping organizations to build and modernize Java-based applications and to really build a user experience in a faster and easier way with a productive developer experience. We have two different proven frameworks for that. We have Vaden Flow, which is fo focused on full stack Java. So for Java developers who want to build a user experience or user interface um, with their existing skill sets. Uh, while Hilla is a framework that's designed for organizations that are often have, they might be full stack developers or separate front end and back end developers, but they want to do the front end in JavaScript TypeScript. Um, in our case, we use TypeScript there. Um, and then they want to have that reactive back end. We also just recently added support for the React framework within Hilla uh, so that Hilla can complement the React framework and make it even faster and easier to develop React-based applications um, using Hilla for those that have a Java backend. So that's a little bit about Vaden. I want to talk a little bit about this report that we're going to be going through today. So this was based on a survey that we conducted in November and December of 2022. Uh, there were just under 900 respondents, and they came across a variety of different organization sizes, industries, and countries. Uh, so we have full demographic data available in the report for download. I won't go through all the details of that today. It is important to note that we did source the respondents from a combination of Vaden's database, but also public social media channels. So about half or just over half of respondents don't use Vaden's frameworks, Flow or Hilla, um, and about just under half do. So it's a mix of those two types of respondents. We do uh, encourage you to share the material in the report. So we license that under an open source license, though the Creative Commons attribution license. Um, so the real main requirement of that is if you take, for example, a chart or you take the data and you want to share it or redistribute it, you just need to provide attribution um, to the report and where it came from, as you see here in this slide. But other than that, you should feel free to, to use and to share. So the last piece I wanted to say about the demographics before we get started is the respondents here are technologists. That was really by design. So about half of the respondents are lead or senior developers, another 20% are developers, and then uh, the remainder are technical management architects or others that are involved in creating and building Java applications. So with that, I want us to move on to some of the first results that we got from the survey. So we asked a number of questions about how Java is being used in their organizations. And really the bottom line here is that Java continues to be really a workhorse in the enterprise. It's a critical foundational technology for many enterprise applications and that investments in Java continue to grow. So let's look a little bit of the data there. The first is really about the types of applications that are being built using Java. And you can see about two thirds of respondents, hang on, I've got a little pop up here that I need to get rid of. About two thirds of respondents are building internal apps and customer facing apps. Um, so people could obviously pick multiple of these. 
So it's being used in both cases. Uh, and then over half were creating apps for partners. And then about 40% were creating custom applications for a particular client. So these would tend to be people that were in, um, for example, the IT services type of field. Now, if you look at the customer facing Java applications and you break that down further, um, over half, 57% were creating internet services for customers. So these weren't necessarily paid products, but rather, hey, I'm a financial institution. I have something that customers are going to use, or I'm some type of a company and I have my customers use this uh, service over the internet. And then 50% were building SaaS products of some sort. Uh, so quite a bit of software respondents within the survey. And then 44% were building on-premise software products. So a lot of this, if you look at really the top two groupings, it's really internet-based, um, not just for on-prem apps. So the next thing we asked them about is the, the, the components or the makeup of those Java applications and and what they're building. So are they building, for example, full stack Java or combined Java backends with other types of front ends? So you can see here uh, some of the different options that we had available. Um, just about 70% were building full stack Java applications and 69% were building new Java backends. Whereas down further down on the list, we can see people who were, for example, building 29% were building new front ends for existing Java backends. Uh, and in the middle there, we had 57% who were modernizing existing Java applications. So I'm curious, Mark, like what do you what do you make of these numbers? Did these surprise you at all? Um, not really, I don't think surprising, but yeah, maybe the full stack, which comes out on top here, one thing to note is that that's not kind of a definition that's set in stone. So there might be a little bit of different ways to an uh, answer that. Also, one thing that came to mind is that there might be a little bit of interplay between the, the move to cloud and the modernize uh, movements here. So. Uh, the need to modernize might drive kind of the desire and need to, to go more to the cloud. Uh, but if, if you're in the cloud, it's also kind of natural or even necessary to, to modernize the UI, especially. Yeah. So these seem to be kind of, kind of uh, consistent, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things we know is like one of our frameworks, Vaadin Flow, is really designed for that full stack Java experience. Um, so since about just under half of our respondents are Vaadin users, we may have a little bit higher preponderance of those full stack Java than might be out in the wild at large. Um, but it's interesting to see that there is that number is well beyond the people that might be using Vaadin because more than half of our respondents were, were not users of Vaadin. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, the survey originated from us, so that's kind of natural, but these are still kind of full-fledged members of, of, the, Vaad, of the Java community or, and ecosystem. So, uh, and there's a lot more that goes into each application than just the UI, so... I think these, yeah. these are quite representative um, results. All right, well, let's move on to how this might change. So in addition to asking what they're doing today, we asked people, how is this going to change over the next two years? And so here you can see, just to explain how this chart works, essentially the things in red were the percentage of people that said they were going to decrease investments there. The gray was staying the same and the green were going to increase. So the dark green is significant increase and the lighter green is increasing somewhat. Uh, so if you look at kind of the, the green parts of the chart, we've sorted this so that the more green it is, the higher it ends up in the chart. Uh, you can see now at the top of the list is moving Java applications to the cloud and modernizing existing Java apps. So what we're hearing essentially is people are going to be increasing their investments in these areas. And, and as you said, it's probably natural these came to the top of the list because they do somewhat go hand in hand. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, that's exactly what's going on here, that they are kind of uh, driving each other depending on 
which end you start at, so to say. Yeah. So if I need to go to the cloud, I'm going to modernize. If I want to modernize, I'm also potentially going to consider deploying in the cloud. Yeah. And many of actually many of the findings we have here seem to kind of uh, support each other and kind of the direction is, is kind of the same and clear. All right, so let's go ahead and do polling question number one. So we're gonna ask a few polling questions throughout that are relevant to, that basically match a few of the questions that we asked in the survey so we can see how this audience compares. So the first polling question, if you go down to the lower right of your screen, there's a polls icon and you should see the first polling question available, uh, which asks you, what are the key challenges in developing Java applications? And you have a number of items to choose from and you can pick more than one. So if you want to take a moment to select the ones that you find challenging in your organization. And then if you scroll down below all the checkboxes, you'll see a button that says submit vote. And once you submit your vote, then you can start to see the stats coming in on how other people are voting. So I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to put your check boxes in there and submit your polls so we can see what are the interesting challenges that you guys are encountering in your Java application development efforts. So it looks like right now, uh, bubbling up to the top of the list, 24% so far is building an intuitive and simple user experience in Second place is upgrading the tech stack, although there's like a, some competition going on. Uh, in third place is optimizing runtime performance and then building cloud or cloud native and ensuring app security. So looks like we've got some good results there. So let's go ahead and move forward and see how the survey respondents answered this same question. And here you can see um, the, the purple represents significant challenge, the blue represents somewhat of a challenge, and the gray was not a challenge. Uh, so you can see up at the top of the list, building an intuitive and simple UX and upgrading the tech stack were the top two items. In this grouping, in the survey, it was ensuring app security. I think for the, the people on this call, performance came in as number three. So, Mark, do you think this, does this surprise you, the, the top two items on the list? Uh, well, again, not so much. Um, I mean, there, there might be, there's a lot to, to kind of, we could unpack here, but maybe one reason, of course, is that UX is, is top of mind and the survey was spread from a UI UX centric source, us. Mm -hmm. So that might play a role. But the reality is that uh, most applications, uh, have some users. So there's a UI and there's a user that's experiencing it. So, uh, but the teams that are building the application are quite often split up. So maybe between backend and front end in say a microservices architecture. And that I think it, what might be one source of this challenge is that uh, some teams are making the API, some teams are making the UI. And so they are not full stack teams in that sense. So uh, the coordination then between these uh, become challenging. And also uh, we find that many teams still do not have kind of a ac access to a designer or a UX expert kind of on the team all the time. So here kind of leveraging design systems, using external designers, um, or just spending some time learning kind of UX basics uh, can get you pretty far. Yeah, and it was interesting also upgrading the tech stack was in number two. I mean, there's just so many dependencies in, I mean, every ecosystem, but certainly in the Java ecosystem as well, whether it's the version of Java that you're on, whether it's backend frameworks like Spring Boot that people are using, whether it's other critical dependencies that people have in their application, there's a lot of moving parts that you need to keep in sync. Yes, and I think it's natural that uh, upgrading the tech stack is next, right next to ensuring app security because uh, the security of the supply chain is a challenge uh, exactly due to all these dependencies that you have. And, and so um, 
these dependencies are what makes it possible to build such complex applications, but there's also a challenge uh, involved there. If you're left behind, you're vulnerable in a security sense, but if you blindly update, you're vulnerable as well. So this is maybe where you can kind of try to find uh, some trusted frameworks that kind of bundle things together and handle part of that for you. Um, so yeah, but there are of course other parts to security as well, but securing the supply chain is kind of universal to all applications. Yeah, completely. That's a definitely been a hot topic for certain, especially uh, the US where I'm based, there's been uh, some government rumblings and sort of semi mandates to require better software supply chain security if you sell to the to the US government. So now the other thing I want to highlight here is number four, which was finding and keeping Java developers. So while that was number four overall, you'll notice the purple part of the bar is quite a bit bigger. That's the biggest purple bar in any in the survey at all, which means that a 30 8% of the people considered it a significant challenge. So the people who are having this as a challenge, it's kind of a big challenge. And I was then reading, you know, like the latest developer nation survey, which is one of the biggest surveys out there of developers. And they do a lot of surveys on language use. And typically Java is in most of these surveys in the top three languages, depending on the particular one you look like you look at. So it's usually typically some combo of JavaScript, Python, and Java. And this past year, especially, they were seeing kind of a resurgence in Java, especially in the people saying that they were planning to kind of grow and use Java more in the coming years. So it almost feels like Java went through this. It was the new shiny thing 20 years ago. It was used to build all these enterprise applications. And then newer, shinier toys came around but all these enterprise Java applications haven't gone away. Um, and now people are like, hey, let's bring Java into the cloud, the cloud native world. They're you know, modernizing those Java apps so that it uh, works just as well in this new cloud world that we're all moving to. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. There was a bit of a, of a kind of uh, period when it was, Java was seen as a bit of a, an old technology, but as we all know, that's not true. And Java has been able to keep innovating and renewing itself. So, so I think now we're in a kind of situation where we are slowly swinging back, but there is, uh, it takes time for kind of the talent pool to shift. So especially in the UI UX space, JavaScript has get, been getting a lot of attention and so on. Uh, so I think it's going to improve, but it will also require us, the Java community, to realizing that this is something we need to work on and kind of uh, try to bring in more talent and nurture through open source and, and kind of uh, teaching people and so on. All right, well, let's keep moving because we've got a lot more to share. So this was really interesting. We asked one open-ended question in the survey, and we just asked a question in a sentence or two, describe your organization's Java strategy. And we kind of let people go wherever they want to go. So I'm going to share a few quotes as we go through. But this was kind of, there was a whole selection of quotes, which I've picked kind of a representative sample here, uh, talking about Java being the foundation of their business. So in this first one up in blue at the top, they're talking about using it for their backend systems. You know, here in some of the ones below, some people are talking about it as their primary technology. Some are saying both front end and back end. Uh, some people saying essential requirement for high end web applications, first choice in their language, default language they use, core to our development. So, of course, you know, this survey is about Java and it does tend to attract people who are using Java. But at the same time, I was kind of a little bit surprised at sort of the very clear definitive statements of where Java sat in their organization. Yeah, I think, I mean, we agree and we have kind of known this, but it's really nice to see it kind of <laughs> summed up here. All right, let's keep going and let's talk about modernization, which came up as one of those items that people were focused on for Java. So first a few stats. So one of the questions we asked was about, are Java apps 
still running on the desktop or have they largely moved to the browser? And the answer is they've largely moved to the browser. So this is the percentage of applications that are being ac accessed on the desktop versus the browser and only 18% are still on the desktop. Now, these browser-based applications, there are some technologies out there that allow you to essentially take a Java application and run it in the browser you know, using your old technologies. So that could be some of this. They may not necessarily have been fully modernized. You could be sort of wrapping them in order to run them in the browser. All right, so the second question we asked about this was that how many of your Java applications need modernization? And we left this open-ended. We didn't define what modernization might be. And the answer was 47%. Uh, on average across the people that we polled. So really about half of Java applications still need modernization. And that could look differently at different organizations. I mean, there might still be some that need to move to the browser. We saw in the last chart, but it could also be, hey, we're getting ready to the cloud or we want to go to cloud native or we need to bring the user interface up to modern standards. This could look like a lot of different things at different organizations. And then we broke that out just to see if there was any regional differences in this. And you can see here that the Americas, uh, it was a little bit lower, 41% needing modernization, 48% uh, in Europe, and then 51% in the rest of the world. So it looked like the Americas had a little bit of a head start, but, but not much. And still we're looking at nearly half of the applications, Java applications needing to be modernized. All right, so let's get you guys involved again. We're going to go to polling question number two. So if you want to go down to that polling tab, and here we're going to talk about um, what are your key motivations to modernize your Java applications? And again, you can select all that apply. Uh, so maintainability, security, improving the UI UX, costs, risks of old technology, you know, ability to add features to meet your business needs, technical debt, or not sure, don't know, or don't want to say, you can click that as an option. Um, so I'm going to go ahead if you want to click those. And then remember, once you select something and submit your vote, you get to see the results. So let's look at how those are coming in. So at the top here is maintainability, followed by risk of old technologies. And below that is improving the UI UX, followed by security risks. All right, let's look at how, oh, we've got more things coming in, but it looks like the, the order is staying about the same. So let's look at how this came out in the, the larger survey. And looks like maintainability and security risks versus in our little survey here on the webinar, it was risks of old technologies, but those might go hand in hand, uh, were the top two. So in the survey, we allowed people to rank and put them in ranked order. And uh, they got to pick, you know, number one, two, three on down the line. And so this is showing you how many people ranked it as number one, number two, or number three. Now, when we did the actual survey, we hadn't included the UI UX answer, um, which is probably an oversight on our part, but I included it in the survey that we did here because it did come up as um, one of the key challenges that people, that people mentioned. So maintainability, security risks, and then kind of the cost of maintaining versus modernizing. So this, this is interesting, maintainability at the top. Does this align with some of those previous answers we saw? <laughs> uh, I, I think so, yes. And, and yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see how these kind of seem consistent. I think maintainability is a broader term. Uh, and in the same sense, you have here security risks, 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 but then we now got a higher result for risk of old technologies. And they, you could see security risks as a subset of that overall risk of the old technologies. And main, maintainability is quite broad. Yeah. I think that one, one point might be that you're aiming for kind of continuous modernization. Maybe you even had to do a big bang 
thing right now, but that you don't want to do again. So you're aiming for actually maintainability to be able to kind of keep your application modern and not do like uh, modernization, big modernization efforts from time to time. So that might play into this. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And the other thing I'm thinking about too, is it could be if you've built on older tech stacks, we're going to talk about tech stacks in a moment, but if you built on older tech stacks 20 years ago, you know, getting engineers that familiar with or want to work on those tech stacks could be interesting. I remember we were talking to like one customer who had, um, I can't remember what the technology was, one of the older desktop technologies for Java. And they're like, all our engineers that know this are retiring. <laughs> so we have to modernize because we can't get resources to work on this anymore. Yeah, that might be kind of, um, yeah, the, the problem, the challenge we saw with finding and keeping Java developers that are yeah. maybe familiar with a particular tech stack. So yeah, that's definitely also kind of from the UI UX perspective. Uh, so how we use applications and what the kind of patterns and what we expect uh, has changed quite a lot. And okay. those older technologies might not be able to address th those needs. Yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, we pulled some quotes. So some people in that same open-ended question I mentioned before brought up modernization. Um, so this was interesting about somebody is currently trying to modernize the UI, swing to web and responsive design and bring the application into the cloud. Um, you know, we also have people trying to, you know, just talking about modernizing in general, you know, changing the frameworks that they're using, you know, so there's people are looking at this from a bunch of different angles. Here was another one that said having a good UX is vital for employees productivity. So we keep looking to modernize our apps. So we see all of those aspects of modernization uh, noted here. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so let's talk about deployment and where Java apps are getting deployed and kind of the shift that we're seeing to cloud native and cloud. So the first thing was we asked about where these applications are getting deployed and uh, we gave them a bunch of different options and then we kind of grouped these into some categories. So the first was on-prem servers and VMs. So kind of traditional on-prem technologies, 70% are deploying there. 56% are deploying to Kubernetes and or serverless environments and 55% to public cloud. And there can of course be overlap between these and people can be deploying to, to multiple. I'd say the part that surprised me the most when I saw the results was not so much the public cloud or the on-prem, but the Kubernetes and serverless ones that, that Java applications were m making that much progress in going to these cloud native type of architectures. Yeah, Kubernetes does seem to have, have won, but maybe the speed at which we're moving to it is, is kind of surprising. Um, I think it provides enough flexibility, both in terms of where you can deploy it and, and kind of what you can deploy to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one, one part. And maybe serverless is kind of the same. You are kind of flexi looking for flexibility. So Kubernetes, maybe it's almost like the missing standard for cloud. So you get kind of a portability there and, and kind of uh, some are using multi-cloud solutions and, and kind of you don't want to be locked in. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's a, a big, big part of that. Uh, I, I guess the public cloud versus private cloud is kind of uh, as expected in the in the kind of enterprise space. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's keep going on that. So the next thing we asked is like which of you know the hyperscaler clouds and you know, not surprisingly, the alignment matches pretty well to what we see in the market at large for cloud providers. So 35% using AWS, 22% Azure, and 11% uh, deploying to, to Google Cloud. And then we did ask a little more detail beyond just those high level questions. So this gives you just a little bit more insight. Um, and this is the data that we use to create kind of that summary slide I showed you a couple ago. But if you start to break it down further, so on-premise servers and VMs here at the top, uh, 
on-prem Kubernetes was kind of the top Kubernetes environment, which was interesting to me. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of tooling that's available to run on-prem Kubernetes today. And then you start to get into public cloud with AWS here at the top with EC2. So that's the traditional VMs from AWS containers. So they have a variety of different container offerings within AWS. And then the, the next option was self-managed Kubernetes in the public cloud. So there's the managed services like, um, you know, e, e, it's like the ECS and EKS in AWS and it's AKS in Azure, but the Kubernetes managed services versus, hey, we're just deploying Kubernetes, you know, pods and nodes into cloud VMs ourselves. And then you can see obviously the AWS and Google, uh, we've got OpenShift down here at 9%. Um, and then, for example, Azure has a specific service for Spring apps, and that's down here at, at 4%. And there were some other options as well, but they were all 3% or less of respondents. So then we asked, okay, in the end, so 55% of respondents are deploying at least some of their apps to public cloud, but what percentage of applications are in the public cloud now? And so the answer he, we got here from this audience on average was 36%. That's kind of pretty much on par with what you see is the numbers people are talking about with deployment into public cloud. I think, you know, the latest maybe Gartner numbers I've seen are in the 40 to 50% range, but that also includes people buying kind of off the shelf SaaS applications um, and here we're talking more probably about custom applications. So, you know, it feels like Java is kind of right there in the ballpark, moving to cloud at roughly the same rate as other types of applications. Yeah. And then again, some people chose to talk about cloud and cloud native and their open-ended responses. Um, and they talked about, you know, strategies of moving things, going to the cloud. One person said our strategy is cloud only Java use, no on-premise. So that's kind of on the far end of the spectrum. Somebody else here said our legacy flagship will slowly be migrated to the cloud. Um, others said, you know, Java and the cloud are going to go hand in hand to them. There are people talking about um, cloud native application development using serverless, using Kubernetes. So a lot of open-ended responses talking about that shift to cloud and cloud native. All right. And then the final section in our survey, and we'll get to your questions. I see we have a couple there in a few moments here. Um, but we wanted to understand about the tech stacks being used with Java. And there's been a lot of survey data and report data out there of people that are either doing survey data or instrumentation, you know, so companies like Datadog or Sneak that are tracking what they're seeing, people using their product, having their ecosystem. So we wanted to really take a different approach, um, which is, yes, we asked a little bit about what they're using, but what is your, where are you going? What does the future look like? Because that's something we can't measure. We can only measure the current usage. So in our questions about Java, we wanted to see where people were on their upgrading to Java 17 and beyond, since there's newer versions as well. Um, and so this was interesting. About a quarter said they were already on Java 17 or newer. Another 21% currently upgrading. Another quarter planning to upgrade in the next 12 months, 11% after the next 12 months and 16% had no current plans. So if you look at this, this would tell us that in about a year, we're going to be three quarters of the way upgraded potentially. Now we didn't ask them like what percentage of your environments, because obviously in an enterprise, you can have a very diverse and large environment. So it could be a, not a point in time, but an evolution over time. But it looks like People are on the path to, to get there. Yeah, it's uh, quite spread out across the whole cake here, but I guess in an enterprise setting, that's to be expected. All the parts need to be in sync and there's kind of security and compliance and all these uh, questions to take into account. And 
uh, servers and maybe the oldest legacy application you have that's not yet modernized is actually keeping yeah. you back. So that's why you're kind of sticking to a specific version. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't upgrade because something doesn't support it. And then something else that needs the new version doesn't work. I mean, we see that in our customers where we have people kind of on an older version because they're not ready to go to some haven't even gone to Java 11 or to Java 17 as our dependency stack upgrades. You know, they need to upgrade their dependency stack and they've got a lot of moving parts that they need to orchestrate in order to make that happen. Yeah, and one, once you get there, you might be able to actually upgrade everything uh, to quite recent releases of everything. But there yeah. might be these things that are holding you back for some, some time. All right. So um, then let's look at what people are using. And this is tech tech specifically around Java is what we're asking about. So for your Java applications, what are you using? Um, so here at the top of the list, we saw... Um, and, and by the way, these colors are the darker purple on the left is significant use, the lighter purple is some use, and then the blue is planned to use. So looking to use that in the future. Um, so if you look here, top of the list, Spring Boot and Spring Framework, probably not a surprise. Those have been popular frameworks for Java for quite a while. Um, Vaden Flow is listed here, as we noted before, you know, this probably tends to attract a little bit more Vaden users because of we're the ones that put out the survey. Um, but over half are not coming from um, our database or not coming from Vaden use. Uh, Jakarta EE is up there, some other spring. We asked about Angular and React specifically for use with the Java backend. So this isn't really representing in the world at large how many people are using Angular or React but how many are using it with Java? So one really interesting thing to me is that Angular kind of inched out React, whereas in the world at large, React is clearly ahead. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, Angular has been traditionally been more popular in the kind of enterprise and business app setting. We have, we have seen this uh, a lot. So it provides a more opinionated framework with, with guardrails and might be suited for teams more. Uh, whereas React has captured more the, of the web space as a whole, but it's a, it's a smaller kind of, it's a library, as they like to say. So that's kind of why Angular has been. Uh, now we can see that uh, a lot are planning to use React. Yeah, uh, just because it's yeah, it's growing kind of generally, and a lot of meta frameworks are cropping up in the React ecosystem. So we are we are quite interested in seeing how this evolves because, like, from the Java point of view, there are not really that many solutions uh, focused on integrating these reactive frontends with Java backends. Uh, so that's you know probably partially explains uh, the largest plan to use on this list is that the Hilla framework made by Vaden uh, is, is kind of a lot are planning to use that. And it's because it has that specific integration point from React to uh, Java. And that's going to be interesting to see how this evolves over time. Will, will React pass Angular or will Angular be able to keep its place here? Yeah, and Quarkus also has a lot of blue plan to use 13%. So, you know, that's, I think, something that's, um, you know, less mature, a newer framework, but it's certainly getting interest. Yeah, and I, yeah, exactly. Quarkus and also Hill, they are quite new so that uh, they will keep growing for some time, whereas some of the very established uh, things on the list here has less of that because they're kind of saturated the market already yeah, so they're kind of at the the tail end instead of the leading end of their market yeah. so so then we did ask uh people kind of the same question what are you planning to use in the future so this was similar to the other one so the greens is they're planning to increase their use significantly or somewhat the red is decrease and the the gray is stay about the same so Spring Boot is still up near the top of the list in terms of increased use. Uh, Vaden, the Spring Framework, Java itself. Um, Hilla, Quarkus, React are all kind of higher on that green list. 
And then maybe not surprisingly, where we see a lot of red down at the bottom is things like uh, Swing and JSF and Java FX, which were some of the you know older technologies that people are generally moving away from. And then lastly, we kind of took that same data and just did kind of a net gainers and net decliners, I guess, is how you would describe it. So we said the percentage of people planning to increase their usage minus the percent planning to decrease to see what the net percent were that we're planning to, to go up versus go down. And so this kind of gives you sort of the stark picture of what we saw on the last slide where you see, hey, um, you know, Java, FX, JSF, and Swing are kind of in that net decline category. Uh, you see Jakarta EE, for example, in the bare, barely green, <laughs> uh, you know, view and angular, some increase, you know, React is a little higher up, Hill is a little higher up, Quarkus is higher up, and then certainly Spring itself, all the Spring uh, frameworks are still still super popular as well as, as well as flow bot and flow all right so that is the last of the day oh sorry this is not the last we have a polling question one last thing i almost forgot good thing we have time all right polls so everybody final polling question your time to participate and this has fewer choices uh, so this is about which of the following integration points do you have for your java app so which of the tools are you guys integrating your Java apps to? So logging tools, observability tools, SSO, Kubernetes, other business applications you might have, like ERP, CRM, et cetera, DevOps and infrastructure as code, um, MFA, cloud services, don't know, or NA. So again, check as many as you want. And then you can submit your vote. Once you've submitted your vote, you can start to see the results coming in. So let's see what's coming up to the top here. So at the top is logging tools with 20% so far, 21%. SSO, 19%. Cloud services. And there's obviously a lot of different cloud services you can integrate to at 13 other business apps at 13, observability at 11. All right, so let's look at how our survey respondents answered this. Not too different, except observability was higher in the bigger survey that we did. So logging tools was still at the top with 72% integrating their Java apps into logging tools of some sort. 61% observability tools, makes sense. Everybody needs to monitor their systems. 53% SSO, and then kind of down to 41, 30s and 40s percent for some of these other services. So a little bit similar, although in this audience on this webinar, observability came in a bit lower than, than where we saw that in the survey. Yeah, thinking about this, that observability is kind of... Uh... A little bit of a newer kind of uh, terminology, if you will. And it's kind of joining together several different things. And logging is actually one of those. So it's some people might just, you know, see these as the same, that you're going to address your logging needs with observability. And for some, it's still kind of they are uh, different things. So that might affect this, how, how we get different results here. All right. And then lastly, again, people chose to talk about this in their open-ended responses. Um, so some people talked about like Java, the JVM itself, um, for example, migrating to Java 11 and to Java 17. Some people talked about framework changes, like beginning to use Angular React or React Vue, Somebody talked about Quarkus. Um, one of the interesting things that popped up that we didn't have in any of the sort of set answers, but did come up in the open-ended was Kotlin. So there were quite a number of people who chose to mention that they were, you know, more starting to use Kotlin for new projects. So this top quote was one of those, but they're saying, you know, more often in the flavor of Spring Boot and Kotlin. 
So still with that JVM approach, um, you know, like in our case, our frameworks work with Kotlin as well as with Java. I suspect that's the case with many of the, the frameworks, um, but looking at Kotlin as the, the specific language. All right, let's um, open it up for questions. So if you have a question, feel free to go to the questions tab and enter a question there. We actually do have one question so far, which is an interesting one. Uh, which is if Vaden offers internships to engineering students in the field of development with Java. So Mark, I think we do, we have done that. I don't know. I, if yes, I, I have the official answer yes. and, and we do, but not like super much. So no promises, yeah. but the way to go about that is to go on our site. So vaden.com slash company slash careers. And there is a place to fill in an open application. And so you can do that. So when uh, intern uh, seats open up, we will be in touch. Ah, so that's okay. that's how that works. That's good. You got the. Uh, you've been slacking somebody in the background with the official getting the official answer, probably. <laughs> I uh, I had it lying around because I two weeks back I I was asking this question. Oh, I got okay. This question, so yes. Okay, you already knew the, the answer. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would mention for people in that learning mode is, of course, open source is a great opportunity to learn. Um, so we do offer our software in um, open source versions of everything that we do. Uh, so you can try that out. You can get active and participate in the community. You can uh, we even have also some free student licenses. So for people that want to use some of our commercial offerings, there are student licenses available. So there's a lot of different ways as a student besides just an internship that you can get involved. All right. So we have a question uh, is how will this research affect Baden? So that's a great question because part of the goal with the research is obviously to share it with the ecosystem at large, but then it also influences us as we, you know, make choices and look how to steer our particular products. And so looking to see, you know, the tools and the frameworks that people want to use, how do we interact with those and support those and make sure those work. So for example, we talked about Quarkus on the rise and Kotlin on the rise. How do we make sure that we work well in those environments? You know, the, the challenges that people face, um, if, you know, obviously the UI UX challenge, that is something that we've always been focused on, but, you know, reaffirming that's a top challenge, but also issues with tech stacks, um, issues with security. What can we do to help with some of those areas? So these are definitely things that inform our choices as we, affect our product strategy, but it also, as we look at how we, you know, in general grow and evolve our business over time. Yeah. Mark, and to I be, don't know if anything yeah. you see that you're like, Oh, this is something we definitely need to do now. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, well, uh, we obviously listen to a lot of different sources. We read kind of all the survey results. So yeah, this is exactly. one of the inputs. I yes. think it's an interesting one because we created it because we saw kind of a gap uh, in this space that is actually quite important to us. And in that sense, it's very relevant to us. But but of course, we follow follow all kinds of different sources to make decisions about the direction. But yeah, this this one is 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 a really good one for us. And I wanted to say as well that we are looking forward to keep doing this and 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 sort of see how the trends evolve over time which will bring more value so uh, as this survey is spreading more widely and we get even bigger audience answering the questions it will just provide more and more value so so tell your colleagues and 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 kind of communities to go download it and and participate next year that's also yeah. a yes for sure all right, we have another question, which I love this question. This is an awesome question. How do you think the new AI technologies will influence the web app development? Yeah, So many places We're... to go with this. <laughs> that, so that's... Mark and yes. I talk about AI quite a bit. So this is yes. a great one. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but yeah, may maybe the main, main point is that judges are still out. Uh, and there are many ways uh, how it can help. 
So I mean, uh, integrating AI into your own UIs uh, is one part, but that's kind of depends on your context and what you are creating. Then we are also seeing some opportunities to use AI to help creating these great user experiences and kind of crafting the UIs and so on. So there, there's a lot of different ways to look at, at this. Well, and also there's the, um, it's not the chat GPT, but the, what's the other one that does the code generation that was built on the open AI stuff? Yeah, Copilot. Copilot, yeah, that they've got in, I think, GitHub now. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got some, Mark and I have been hatching some wild ideas <laughs> <laughs> yes. about the use of AI and in, in helping to uh, design that UI and the UX or help you to easily create it or to help you easily modernize applications. So, so that's like one thing somebody asked, the same person actually asked how the research would affect us. So, you know, we've, we've always had this modernization angle at Vaden, you know, like we knew that that was a good part of what our users wanted to do is kind of almost equally like greenfield and modernization. We're, we're working, we're not just working with like the bleeding edge internet companies that get to just start from scratch. We're working with enterprises that often have existing stuff that they need to replace. And then they're also building new things as well. And so as we, you know, this survey kind of reinforced this modernization issue that it is a big issue for companies and something that they're focused on. And so we've been kind of thinking about this idea, like, Hey, I've got a application that was built 10 or 20 years ago, whatever age that might be, which there's a lot of that out there in enterprises. And I need to bring this into the new world, but I got, you know, hundreds of screens in this thing, hundreds of views. I got a huge user interface and like the lift involved in, bringing all those things to the new world is really difficult. You know, what if we could use AI to look at those screens and do a starting point generation of your new application based on what's there, which you could then evolve, but we would do that in a, in a modern way with modern technology and a modern user experience. So these are still like, you know, this is not like we're about to release a product to do this, but these are the, the, the crazy ideas that Mark and I have <laughs> that we're that we're working on and and looking at doing some prototyping around. Yeah, and you're touching on an important point that I think we, we should point out that uh, I think that the major steps we'll see, like in the foreseeable future, will be more about augmenting and speeding up your work and helping you, not yes. replacing. And it's really hard to replace any one specific. Like, yeah person in your team that's not going to happen really soon but but augmenting and helping that that is the main opportunity here yeah exactly exactly okay we've got a few more questions um will let's see we've got some more specific vaden questions will vaden flow still be available with feature upgrades pure java components or will vaden hello replace be the focus of the company since client side typescript is so popular Vodenflow is not going anywhere. So we are continuing to develop it. We put a lot of resources behind it. We have lots of upgrades and things that we're adding on. So Vodenflow will continue to exist for the foreseeable future. Um, so Hilla, which is our second framework, is really designed for teams that are taking a different approach. So even in customers who use Vodenflow, there are teams within their organization that are doing kind of a JavaScript TypeScript with Java backend. So Hilla is really designed for those applications and those teams. Um, may, maybe we will see some people who've been Vodenflow in the past migrate those same applications to Hilla, but that's not really our expectation, honestly. Our expectation more is that there will be different teams or different applications that are taking a different approach that, that Hilla will be a fit for. Um, so then we have a question about is Vue.js integration easy with Vaden or is React the recommended option? So the, the approach with React is, so what we've done is we've added support for React with Hilla because Hilla is designed for that type of a technology stack um, with that reactive approach. 
Um, but React has doesn't do everything that you need. There's still a lot, just because you're using React, there's still a lot of work to do. And Hilla helps to fill some of those gaps. We also provide all of our UI components with React wrappers. So you can use those UI components in a React friendly way. Uh, we are also looking at Angular. So Angular is, as you saw in this survey, and we've heard from our customers, Angular is also very popular within the Java ecosystem. So we're looking at doing something similar to what we did with React with Angular. So if that's something you're interested in, reach out and we would love to hear about your use cases. Um, now, Vue, we've also kind of had on the radar, but it's, as you saw, it's kind of in the third place there. Um, I don't know, Mark, would you say the integration is easy with Vaden? I don't know if I have a, a, a opinion to share on that. Yeah, easy. I haven't tried it myself, so it's just yeah, <laughs> say. say. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think some people have, have experimented with it and tried it. And, and I mean, uh, Hilla is, is agnostic in that sense, but we just haven't built any help for doing that. So you would probably be able to use kind of the core Hilla functionality with Vue, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not sure where there would be rough edges or, uh, but as I said, we don't have those starting points or potentially wrapping some APIs that would make it easier to use or something like this. Uh, the components are based on web components. So those work as well as web components in general work with Vue, but yeah, so the specific support for Vue is not there, so it will be kind of more uh, up to you uh, than so. Your, your instance, mileage yeah. may vary depending on. Uh... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we have one last question. Um, thanks for the live sessions. I have a question related to the add-ons directory. Is there a plan to make a platform where developers could run their add-ons so other devs could see the add-on functionality in real life? Heroku does not offer free deployments anymore. So the person that answered, asked this, Taras, I hope I'm saying your name right. I'm guessing you've been talking to Sami at Vaden, <laughs> who's on our DevRel team. Uh, so this is definitely an internal conversation that we've been having to figure out if there is a way that we could make that happen. So we are um, exploring some options, but I don't, we, we're not, we don't have anything imminent, I would say, but, but the idea is not a bad one. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Um, just FYI, I think I, I should have put this up earlier. If you want to get the full report with all of the charts and all of the commentary, uh, this is where you can get it, vaden.com, java-survey-2023. Or if you go to our homepage, you'll see there's like a big black box. You can click the link and download it there. Feel free to share. As we said, we've open sourced those charts so you can use them in your own presentations or share them with others. Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thank you, see you.